Welcome to our course, Fundamentals of Operating Systems, based on the text, Operating System Concepts, 10th edition, by Abraham Silbershots, Graham Cagney, and Peter B. Galvin. In the last lesson, we were discussing the dining philosopher's synchronization problem. In this lesson, we're going to start discussing how Windows and possibly Linux handles synchronization issues. So let's get started. These two operating systems, Windows and Linux, provide good examples of different approaches to synchronizing the kernel. And as you'll see, the synchronization mechanisms available in these systems differ in subtle but significant ways. The Windows operating system is a multi-threaded kernel that provides support for real-time applications and multiprocessors. When the Windows kernel accesses a global resource on a single processor system, it temporarily masks interrupts for all interrupt handlers that may also access the global resource. On a multiprocessor system, Windows protects access to global resources by using spin locks, although the kernel uses spin locks only to protect short code segments. Furthermore, for reasons of efficiency, the kernel ensures that a thread will never be preempted while holding a spin lock. For thread synchronization outside the kernel, Windows provides dispatcher objects. Using a dispatcher object, threads synchronize according to several different mechanisms, including mutex locks, semaphores, events, and timers. The system protects shared data by requiring a thread to gain ownership of a mutex to access the data and to release ownership when it's finished. Same story we've heard already. Semaphores behave as we discussed earlier. Events are like condition variables, that is, they may notify a waiting thread when a desired condition occurs. Finally, timers are used to notify one or more than one thread that a specified amount of time has expired. Dispatcher objects may be in either a signal state or a non-signal state. An object in a signal state is available and a thread will not block when acquiring the object. An object in a non-signal state is not available, and a thread will block when attempting to acquire the object. The state transitions of a mutex lock dispatcher object are illustrated in this graphic on the right. A relationship exists between the state of a dispatcher object and the state of a thread. When a thread blocks on a non-signal dispatcher object, its state changes from ready to wait, and the thread is placed in a wait queue for that object. When the state of the dispatcher object moves to signal, the kernel checks whether any threads are waiting on the object. If so, the kernel moves one thread, or possibly more than one thread, from wait state to ready state, where they can resume executing. The number of threads the kernel selects from the wait queue depends on the type of dispatcher object for which the thread is waiting. The kernel will select only one thread from a wait queue for a mutex since the mutex object may be owned by only a single thread. For an event object, the kernel will select all threads that are waiting for the event. We can use a mutex lock as an illustration of dispatcher objects and thread states. If a thread tries to acquire a mutex dispatcher object that is non-signaled, that thread will be suspended and placed in a wait queue for the mutex object. When the mutex moves to the signal state because another thread has released the lock on the mutex, the thread waiting at the front of the queue will be moved from the wait state to the ready state and will, will acquire the mutex lock. A critical section object is a user mode mutex that can be acquired and released without kernel intervention. To catch that, a critical section object 
is a user mode mutex that can be acquired and released without kernel intervention. On a multiprocessor system, a critical section object first uses a spin lock while waiting for the other thread to release the object. If it spins too long, the acquiring thread will then allocate a kernel mutex and yield its CPU. Critical section objects are particularly efficient because kernel mutex is allocated only when there is a contention for the object. In practice, there is very little contention, so the savings are significant. The earliest version of Linux was a non-preemptive kernel, meaning that a process running in kernel mode could not be preempted, even if a higher priority process became available to run. Now, however, the Linux kernel is fully preemptive, so a task can be preempted when it is running in kernel. Linux provides several different mechanisms for synchronization in the kernel. As most computer architectures provide instructions for atomic versions of simple math operations, the simplest technique within the Unix kernel is an atomic integer, which is represented by using the data type atomic T. As the name implies, all math operations using atomic integers are performed without interruption. To illustrate, consider a program that consists of an atomic integer counter and an integer value as you see on the right side of this slide. Atomic integers are particularly efficient in situations where an integer, like this counter, needs to be updated. Since atomic operations do not require the overhead of locking mechanisms. However, their use is limited to these sorts of scenarios. In situations where there are several variables contributing to possible race conditions, more sophisticated locking tools must be used. Mutex locks are available in Linux in protecting critical sections within the kernel. Here, a task must invoke mutex lock function prior to entering a critical section and the mutex unlock function after exiting the critical section. If the mutex lock is unavailable, a task calling mutex lock is put into a sleep state similar to what you saw in that previous slide and is awakened when the lock's owner invokes mutex unlock. Linux also provides spin locks and semaphores as well as reader writer versions of these two locks for locking in the kernel. On symmetric multiprocessing machines, the fundamental locking mechanism is a spin lock. And the kernel is designed so that the spin lock is only held for short durations. On single processor machines, such as embedded systems with only a single processing core, spin locks are inappropriate for use and are replaced by enabling and disabling kernel preemption. That is, on systems with a single processing core, rather than holding a spin lock, the kernel disables kernel preemption. And rather than releasing the spin lock, it enables kernel preemption. This is summarized here. The table shows a single processor disables kernel preemption and enables kernel preemption, and multiprocessors acquire spin lock and release a spin lock. In the Linux kernel, both spin locks and mutex locks are non-recursive. This means that if a thread has acquired one of these locks, it cannot acquire the same lock a second time without first releasing the lock. Otherwise, the second attempt at acquiring the lock will block. Linux uses an interesting approach to disable and enable kernel preemption. It provides two simple system calls, preempt disable and preempt enable for disabling and enabling kernel preemption. The kernel is not preemptible, however, if a task running in the kernel is holding a lock. To enforce this rule, each task in the system has a thread info structure containing a counter, preempt count, to indicate the number of locks being held by the task. When a lock is acquired, preempt count is incremented. It is decremented when a lock is released. If the value of preempt count for the task currently running in the kernel 
is greater than zero, it is not safe to preempt the kernel, as this test currently holds a lock. If the count is zero, the kernel can safely be interrupted, assuming there are no outstanding calls to preempt disable. Spin locks, along with enabling and disabling kernel preemption, are used in the kernel only when a lock, or disabling kernel preemption, is held for a short duration. When a lock must be held for a longer period, semaphores and mutex locks are appropriate for use. Your textbook also has a description of the POSIT synchronization, which I won't go into. It would be a good idea for you to look that material over, however. I think this is a good place to stop. We've talked about the Windows and the Linux uh, versions of synchronization. Take a few minutes, update your study guide, take care of any business you have to do, and when you're ready, come on back and we will continue with our discussion of these examples of synchronization.